This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 740, recorded on April 6th, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon Despommier. Hello, everybody, and hello, Vincent. I've got my window slightly cracked open, so if the noise is too much, tell me to shut it. But right now, it's so delightful. The air is coming through. The sun is shining. The birds are tweeping. The buds are budding. The flowers have flowered. The fish are rising. And I'm all set to go fishing tomorrow. So this is all going to be good stuff. And um, welcome to the new fishing season and uh, everything else. (laughs) <laughs> I'm sure that matters, but for me right now, that's what matters. <laughs> also joining us from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, it's great to be here. Um, it is similar to Dixon, uh, sunny, gorgeous, <laughs> 64 um, Fahrenheit, uh, a lovely day. Sadly, I won't go fishing tomorrow, but other than that, pretty much the same. From Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Here, it's even warmer. It's 73 Fahrenheit going to 77, which is 23 Celsius going to 25. And it's sunny and gorgeous. So you guys can look forward to it even warmer tomorrow. And from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. Uh, 78 Fahrenheit headed for 80. I would say I would call this partly sunny, (laughs) meaning mostly cloudy. But I my glass is my weather glass is half full. Mm -hmm. It's 18C here. Pretty nice out. Blue skies. Yeah, the weather's getting nicer. Although this past weekend, it was a little chilly uh, Saturday night, I think. It was. I want to remind everyone about NIDO 2021, the NIDO virus symposium being organized by Jan Bosch and other coronavirologists from the Netherlands. You can register. This is happening June 7th or so, and it's online only. You you can pay 95 euros and hear a lot of good talks. So I highly recommend it. We will put a link to that in the show notes. And Rich, your your, uh, vaccine town halls continue, right? Uh, Yeah, I would not necessarily call them mine. I would call them ASVs or Kathy's even. Not mine either. Well, you put a lot of work into it. Actually, the brain is the brainchild of uh, Dan Engel at the University of Virginia. Uh, Very briefly, go to asv.org slash education. Sign up for any number of free town halls where you can talk to two experts in the field and ask your questions about vaccination and tell your friends because this is the place to get the real story on vaccination. Are you you saying TWIV is not the place to get the real story? Uh, TWIV is the place, but you can go to these and actually in person ask your own (laughs) questions. Okay. Okay? And And you don't have to put up with it for two hours. It's like 45 minutes max. Yeah. And there might even be one coming up or maybe it's already happened in uh, in Spanish. I know that there's a couple of people putting uh, yeah. that together. Mm-hmm. And they, if there's if that's popular, they may do another one. And Kathy, you want to do an ad for your uh, position? Sure. I have a research lab specialist intermediate position in my lab, at microbiology and immunology at the University of Michigan Medical School. And we work on mouse adenovirus. And so if somebody is interested in working on mice and viruses, uh, that would be a good fit. Uh, we're looking for somebody who has uh, a BS plus maybe three years of experience or a master's degree and a little bit of experience, uh, some combination thereof. Uh, it's open immediately, so you can apply. Uh, we have, we'll put the link in the show notes, but you can also go to the ASV job site and find the ad there, and that's at asv.org. Today marks a historic day for TWIV, we start non-COVID papers on Tuesdays. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's good. This is going to be a thing? Well, not. A, I, I think, as Kathy suggested, we should alternate them with Fridays. But I want to have of, one TWIV a week, as long as we do two, to have non-COVID papers. Sort of ease people into this. We need mm-hmm. to ease yeah. people in. Wait, and there are other viruses? 
Yeah, there are other viruses. <laughs> And, uh, you know, you need to learn outside of COVID and um, we need to get back to what we started with, other viruses. So, uh, and today's is, has relevance. I mean, everything is going to in some way have relevance. So um, that's the that's the point. Well, of course, our email have a, they're all COVID related. So you just stick around for those, but don't leave. Uh, I know that on some of the other, like immune, <laughs> the last immune we did, Car T and Car mm -hmm. Mac and Car N and got a fraction of the usual views on YouTube. People just want to hear about COVID. I'm sorry, folks. Which is bad because Car Macs and Car and K's and Car T's are so cool. Really fascinating stuff. Yeah. And, I have uh, to say that this, uh, uh, for non COVID papers, this paper is really jumping into the deep end here. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It, it, we're going to work hard to simplify it because. Uh, I would totally uh, agree with you there, Rich. It is, uh, <laughs> the weeds are thick in this one, but <laughs> it's a really good paper. It's in, a great in, paper. Know, in, in, in the tradition of fine scientific, it's extensive. There's a lot of work here. There are not a billion authors, which is very cool. So this is a paper published uh, in, a, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And I have to say, Amy sent this to me last week. She said, this would be such a cool non-COVID paper. Yeah, well, thank you, Amy, because I was wondering where you, how you came up with this. Uh, good work, go. Amy. Rescue of codon pair deoptimized respiratory syncytial virus by the emergence of genomes with very large internal deletions that complemented replication. How about that for a mouthful? Yeah. <laughs> the authors are Nguyen, McCarty, Yang, Brown, Wimmer, Collins, and Buchholz from uh, NIAID, uh, Pacific Biosciences, and Stony Brook University. Now, Becky reason, Wimmer is still at it. Mm -hmm. Eki is still at it. Yeah. I, I, um, I had a little email exchange with him a few weeks ago. Eckhard Wimmer is a very senior, well-known coronavirologist. And, um, I, I asked him for some antisera that he had published, you know, 40 years ago. <laughs> and he said, uh, I have no idea where anything is. <laughs> he said, the freezers are disorganized and, and, and I, probably a lot of things were thrown out and he said, could you imagine asking NIH for a grant to support my freezers? I think they would laugh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yet he was uh, very kind as usual. And and he's the, the beginning of this story that we'll tell you about today. The, the overall view here is that this is a recoding viral genomes, um, which is part of the title, codon pair deoptimized. We'll get into that in a moment. It's a way to potentially make attenuated uh, vaccines. And Eckhard Wimmer did this years ago for polio virus and showed that you could change the codons in the open reading frame, make essentially thousands of single base changes without changing the protein sequence. And the virus would be attenuated in experimental animals. It would not cause polio but it would be antigenic and, you know, in theory could be a vaccine. And in fact, if you go to the Milken vaccine tracker, you will find two codon deoptimized, codon pair deoptimized uh, vaccine candidates, you know, in preclinical trials, which means it's many years away. But, um, you know, it's an idea. Now, I always, I, when, when Eckhart published this years ago, I thought it was brilliant Thousands of changes. What's the, so the problem with the polio vaccine or any attenuated vaccines is you can get reversion, right, of the changes that have been fixed in the genome to reduce attenu uh, virulence. So for polio virus vaccines, the saving vaccines there are only a few, and they revert readily. So this idea was attractive. Thousands of changes. What's the likelihood of reversion? But we're going to tell you today can happen. <laughs> Vincent, can I just ask an innocent question here? Yeah, the, sure. Um, changing the codon pairs, does this um, slow down the rate of protein synthesis? Because the, think, uh, yeah. the does it or doesn't it? Yeah, Why you make it, less protein. You make less protein. You make less because it takes yeah. longer to get used to the fact that it's not exactly a fifth, but it's okay. But well, yeah, I think I think the idea is uh, for once again for the uh, naive folks out there because of the nature of the genetic code. 
there is more than one way to encode uh, a given amino acid. Uh, some amino acids have like six different triplet codons, six different ways to make that amino acid. So I think there's only one that has only one way, and that's methionine. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, so what that means is that uh, you can change the nucleotide sequence of something without actually changing the amino acid sequences of a, pro of a protein. And in different organisms, some of those codons are used more frequently than others. So the idea is to uh, uh, recode something like this virus to use codons that are used less frequently. And that have, would have the effect of not changing the coding sequence or uh, the actual, uh, uh, the amino acid sequence of the proteins, but slow them down. Yeah. But I think there's other stuff going on. As, uh, I, uh, you know, uh, I recall a, a lot of debate about the actual mechanism of mm -hmm. these recoding things. Yeah, that's what I want to know. Um, and that doesn't, that's not exclusively to do with the uh, abundance of codons or codon usage, but I forget, I forget the details of those debates. Hmm. I mean, I always thought that the recoding must affect RNA structure, right? I, yeah, exactly. And however, today's papers suggest, at least for this case, in the cells they use, it's about amount of protein, right? Right. And so, but it could be that in other viruses, it's about altering RNA structure as well. Yeah. So I think, I think there could be a few different things going on. Um, so, you know, if we have a multiple different um, codons that code for alanine, say, um, there are probably different amounts of the tRNA that uh, is important for making that alanine. And the cell probably has one that it makes more of than others. And that it might be the cell's codon that it's biased towards using. Um, and there might be less of a tRNA that the cell doesn't use as often. And so that would be an easy way to imagine how changing the codon um, would still give you alanine, but would slow down the process of making that because you don't have enough tRNAs to make this. Um, I think there's also probably some role for RNA structure, just like Vincent said. And there might also be some role for um, ability to be sensed by some of the innate immune or intrinsic immune sensors um, that sense things like uh, CPG content. Right. Could you re-optimize, though, by changing the tRNA structure to yeah. match the yeah. decoded? Yeah. So then you uh, theoretically you back or up to speed again. Theoretically, or the level of uh, level of expression, or something like that. I, mean, I, I was, I was, just, I was just thinking. There's a flip side to this because uh, quite often it is um, of value to express, say, a gene from E. coli in a eukaryotic cell. Right. Uh, and they have different uh, codon biases. Uh -huh. And so uh, it's not uh, typically as part of that nowadays, uh, one uh, uh, does a codon optimization on whatever right. it is, okay? Right. To right. plug in the codons that are likely to work better in a eukaryotic cell. Mm -hmm. So is the... Um Codon usage different from, say, species to species, mammalian, like bats versus humans? Yes. Do we know? Great question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I think that some of the spike uh, have been codon optimized for humans as opposed to uh, bats. Uh, I'm not sure, but so you can, Brianne, you're sure that species have different. I uh, am. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So she Bruce Wayne would really be an sure exception that. to that rule. Is that right, uh, Vincent? <laughs> I'm sorry, what did you say? Yeah, Bruce Wayne would be an exception to that rule, I yeah. presume. <laughs> the reason I mention is because uh, giant viruses encode a lot of uh, tRNAs, and it may be so that they can ease, more efficiently translate the proteins encoded in their genomes, which may have a slightly different um, amino acid, you know, tRNA uses in the host. I had not thought of it that way. Good point. The, um, other thing, and Kathy reminded me of this uh, before the show, is that it's all about pairs, right? Adjacent codon pairs, not just one pair in what codon is coding. And like you can have one amino acid coded for six different, right? That's fine. But it's actually the pairs, the, the, the um, pairs that are next to each other. Um, adjacent pairs can be encoded by as many as 36 different pairs of codons and a species specific codon pair bias provides that some synonymous codon pairs are used 
more or less frequently than statistically predicted. So you basically mess with that. You mess, that's why it's called codon pair deoptimized. Right. It's not just about changing a single codon at a time. And this is done by a computer program. You, you feed it the sequence and it spits out what you should be making. Very cool. So Eckhart Wimmer first did this with poliovirus. Very exciting. And then others followed, including uh, the, the authors of this paper uh, with a paramyxovirus respiratory syncytial virus. Um, and and uh, one of the things they note is that, you know, there's this idea that you make, and Eckhart called it death by thousand by a thousand cuts, right? <laughs> In one of his papers. Um, it, the idea is that you can't revert. So the, you know, the poliovirus Sabin vaccines have a handful of mutations, but it's easy for those to revert. But if you have thousands, does that make it harder? I don't know. Intuitively, you would think so, but you should never underestimate viruses, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, as we're going to see. Um, and so they said this has not really been pushed. We've we've never studied in depth the stability of the attenuation conferred by all these changes. And that's uh, what they're doing here. And I, and I actually pulled out a paper I wanted to mention because they did this with bacteriophage T7, Rich. They mm. codon deoptimized the major capsid gene and they passed it and tried to see uh, if, it, if it ever changed, right? And they conclude uh, that, and this is uh, Ian Molyneux is one of the authors who sure. you, you must know, right? Yep. Overall, the study supports the premise that codon modified viruses recover fitness slowly, although the evolution is substantially more rapid than expected from the design principle. And that's it. You know, we all assume, ah, thousands, no problem. Uh, I have to say that all the way through this paper, I'm thinking about the conspiracy theory about the uh, created a virus uh, in the lab in Wuhan. Rich about thought, how uh, this it was thing an identical is, thought. <laughs> yeah, and about how this thing uh, really demonstrates over and over and over again that we're clueless. All right. <laughs> uh, and before uh, before we get into this, I just want to do ten seconds. The virus in question here is respiratory syncytial virus, a nasty human pathogen, uh, uh, causes significant disease in children, uh, negative sense, single-stranded RNA virus enveloped about 10 to 11 KB in length, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, been very difficult to make a vaccine to this. Uh, and so um, uh, it's a great candidate. Uh, for uh, making a vaccine. How prevalent is that disease, Rich? Mm. Uh, it's all over the place. I think your, uh, your, I, my guess is seropositivity in the population is like a lot of other common viruses up in the 90%. I don't know for sure. Do you know, Vincent? Not offhand, no. I think is it's a, a very, big? it's a very common infection, uh, I believe. And one of these things uh, where immunity can wane and you can be reinfected uh, but uh, the reinfections are not as nasty because there's some uh, residual immunity. Um, uh, but in some fraction of children who catch this disease, it can cause a very nasty respiratory disease. Am I from mortality too? It's hundred percent seropositivity by okay. five years of age. Wow! Wow! Uh, you know, it's been a you know. Uh, I used to be. I used to have this stuff um, closer to home when I was teaching. It's been a while. Right. Uh, 45, <laughs> Sounds pretty good, though. <laughs> four to five million infections in children per year and 177,000 hospitalizations in the U.S., 14,000 deaths in elderly over 65 years of age. Oh, is that right? Oh, my. Yeah, yeah. It's, so this is a nasty, older, yeah. nasty critter. We need a vaccine for this guy. Wow. So, so Rich, you mentioned that this is um, an RNA virus. Um, yeah, strand, yeah. Do you think that um, the effect of codon optimization would be different in a DNA virus versus an RNA virus or the uh, effect of how quickly we might see reversion? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I would think it would I would think that the uh, reversion, uh, if it occurs at all, would be quicker in an RNA virus because they can't prove free and they have a higher mutation rate. Um you know, in terms of mechanism, you know, Vincent mentioned uh, RNA structure 
And in an RNA virus where the RNA is a genome, I might uh, think that the impact on structure would be different than in a DNA virus where the RNA is just an intermediate. So you raise a lot of interesting questions. I would expect, let's put it this way, I would expect that at least to some extent, uh, codon deoptimization might play out differently in a DNA relative to an RNA virus. Well, as we'll see, the, the, the reversion in this case is really mainly by recombination deletions, right? And so DNA viruses are pretty good at recombining, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So uh, maybe I've, that would this would be an interesting experiment to do with a DNA virus uh, because you might be surprised, right? <laughs> if you're talking about point mutations, then yes, but that's not the major mechanism, as we'll see. It's uh, uh, one of the one of the I, I'm gonna there. And your virus is good at that. There's right. yeah, there's one element of this. Uh, well, we better get into the paper because otherwise, otherwise, you know, I I want to I, I want to spill the beans, you know. But the one of the nice things about this paper is that they drag you along with their <laughs> uh, with their history I, and their thinking. They don't just yeah, you get the answer in the abstract, okay? But they go through the whole evolution of their thinking and everything else and take you through the experiments. And so there are several punchlines mm -hmm. uh, as you read this. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, so uh, re coronaviruses are good at recombination as well. So, mm -hmm. and your your poxviruses are also very good. So great at recombination. So are adenoviruses. Adenoviruses are good at it too. Mm -hmm. Are there anybody viruses? that isn't? <laughs> well, the poxviruses are not as good as, well, I was going to say, at making these uh, uh huge rearranged particles, but that's not entirely mm. true. It's a good uh, question, Dixon, because we used to think like poliovirus wasn't very good. Uh, and then we got tools to measure recombination and it turns <laughs> out it's quite frequent. I mean, look at how many particles per cell that you get. However, it's amazing that lots more things don't happen. It's just truly amazing. I mean, however, here's the thing. So recombination per se is... You know, if you're talking about construction of hybrid molecules, mm. the negative strand vi RNA viruses do not do that. They do make deletions and defective particles, as we'll see. That happens. But recombination, you know, all the reported, it, it, if you go in the sequence database, you can find some rare instances of recombination among paramyxoviruses, but they're all sequence artifacts. People believe that that does not happen between two different genomes, maybe because the genomes are protein coded. We're not sure, but they certainly, the polymerases do skip and make deletions. So even though we call it recombination, it's not joining of two different viral sequences. Okay. All right. So the here, respiratory syncytial virus, uh, they had previously done the recoding CPD. It's not CBD, CPD. <laughs> Codon pair deoptimization. CPT, CPD oil, that's what this paper is. It's legal, it's legal, it's God damn it. Extract of uh, RSV. They had recoded different open reading frames and they made four different viruses with the, up to nine uh, codon pair deoptimized open reading frames. And they note that each of these four were temperature sensitive. A phenotype also seen with other viruses. And they were also somewhat attenuated uh, in, in vitro and in animals. So again, that's why these are potentially uh, vaccine candidates. But they note that uh, only if you recode G and F, so the virus encodes a G, a glycoprotein, and an F, a fusion protein, which are both invo which are involved in attachment and fusion, right? So if you only recode those two, these are the most restricted. And they say this suggests to us that G and F are really important for limiting uh, replication of this particular virus. But importantly for this paper, we'll get back to G. G the G story is very interesting. Um, and they use the temperature sensitive phenotype. In other words, uh, as, as Rich well knows, uh, you can make mutant viruses that don't reproduce well at high temperatures, right? The, the high, what is high depends on your particular, in our lab, for polio, we used to use 39.5 degrees Celsius as the, and Kathy, we used to call it the non-permissive temperature. 
Yes. Some people call it the restrictive temperature. I guess right. they do that. In this what did you call it, Rich? I call it the non-permissive temperature. Yeah, I was taught non-permissive is the better term, but yeah. And then the permissive would be like 32 Celsius, right? So normally you grow cells and viruses at 37. Well, normally. Which is like 98.6. And so permissive for a mutant with, with these kinds of lesions would be 32 and non-permissive 39 and a half. Um, so they used temperature as a way to say, oh, can we pass these viruses, these codon deoptimized viruses at high temperature and get them to revert? That's a nice selection. And you measure temperature sensitivity as a quick first uh, view as, as to whether you've, you've achieved your, your goal or not. And I think um, it's important to keep in mind that uh, we're talking about a, one particular type of selection, temperature, and we're yeah. talking about cell culture. So yes. this is not not a real world situation, but it nevertheless investigates the general phenomenon of can we revert this phenotype in any fashion at all? And and they yeah the cell point this is in cell culture and it's in vero cells, vervet monkey kidney cells, um, and we'll come back to that later. Okay, what that means. I was, I was going to say, just to loop in the uh, coronavirology crowd, that <laughs> uh, um, F and G together are more or less the equivalent of spike in coronaviruses. Yeah. Studying the surface already. of the virus. Rich, they're gone already. They're gone. You think so? They're gone. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to do something else, you know, turn this <laughs> off. Sorry. I'm getting used to the idea that we're going to be alone again. It's fine. There's, they still got dogs. The dogs <laughs> care. <laughs> They're going to listen to Howard Stern, don't you think? Don't you think Caleb is still listening? <laughs> Could be. Caleb Jeez. is like 25. Caleb must now. be 18, 25. Hey, whatever. imagine how much virology he's learned. <laughs> I've learned a lot, too. Mm. I'm afraid I have to admit that I have also... You have your, just, you just have by admit, listening. Yeah. It's just by listening. It's just uh, it's it never ceases to be fascinating. This this is remarkable. And nobody seems to understand the underlying mechanism. That seems like hasn't you know, this heard, been known uh, for a long time? <laughs> I heard uh, I listened to some tech podcasts, and this morning they were they said, and I I laughed when they said this. Yeah, you know, because of this pandemic, we've had to learn some things about viruses. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> sure. Damn it. Sure. <laughs> it's the same podcast where back a year ago they were calling the virus COVID. And I had to, I tweeted at them. I said, no, get it right from the start, please. Anyway, uh, so we have a virus here, RSV, and the, their variant is called Min B. And has had, has had recoded open reading frames for G and F, and the G has 100. 97 changes and the F has 422 changes. These are silent, right? The protein is the same. 619 changes totally. And this makes the virus temperature sensitive. Uh, so they're, they compare 32 to 38. Okay, that's their non-permissive, 38. And they get a hundredfold reduction in, in virus yield. They get small plaques at the high temperature, right? So that's the uh, that's the phenotype we're looking at here, and then they do what they call a temperature stress test. I've never heard of it put that way, but that's a funny way of putting it, right? Mm -hmm. I like Bikram yoga. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that when you do it at, at 105 degrees? Yeah, right. Yeah, um, it's very non-permissive. <laughs> hot yoga. So they infect cells, vero cells. Remember, low multiplicity of infection, and then they passage the virus. They did this for five months of passage at, at 32, and then they then they slowly increase the temperature for the actual experiment, um, you know, it, higher and higher and higher. And, uh, you know, then after five months, they stopped and they, they went back and did titrations of everything. And what you can see is that the, you know, the control, the 32 initially, the titer rises and then it keeps more or less constant over time, 32 degrees. Uh, but then as you raise the temperature, you get a, uh, uh, an, uh, at the lower temperatures, you have an increase. Then as you raise the temperature, the titers decrease, and then it goes back up at the end, at the at the higher temperatures. Um, so that's the starting material for this paper. 
They and did. They, they did five of these in parallel mm -hmm. so that they could ask the question, you know, do you get this? Do you get the same thing every time? Yeah, is the right. is the mechanism the same every time? That's a good idea. Instead of doing one and then after five months saying, oh, crap, we should have done that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because right. changing these incubators, you know, one yeah. degree at a time, yeah, yeah. painful. A lot of mean, work. So, um, the, the, besides temperature sensitivity, they could look at cytopathology, the ability of the virus to kill cells, sure. and um, the, the the this virus causes fusion, right, and syncytia formation, fused cells, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so. The, the min B, the parent, didn't make evident syncytia, uh, but the later passages of each lineage, including the ones uh, done at 32, can form syncytia. So they think this is an early indication that these uh, the passage has led to increased production of functional fusion or F protein, which is a, 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 a good clue, I think, for what's going to happen. They also looked at plaque size. And um, th that increases with passage. They looked at production of F by immunofluorescence, and that goes up with passage as well. So uh, the, the result of all this serial passage, either at 32 or at increasing temperatures, gives you viruses with increased replication and production of the F protein. That's the bottom line here. So now, having done this experiment, what would you do, folks? Well... It's, it's is 2021, you start doing genome sequencing. Mm -hmm. If it were 1930 or 40 or 50, you'd do other things because <laughs> you have and, no genome sequencing. And you here. might do, in later years, you might do restriction mapping or something. You could do restriction so, mapping, but you well, could do- Well, these are RNAs, so maybe not. So you could yeah. Do, you could do, put them in complementation groups, right? Right, right. Mm -hmm. Oh, what do black assays. <laughs> what a mess that would be. <laughs> they do a lot of black assays, but they, they do genome sequencing. And this is where- like Rich said, they they drag you through this. There's a lot of paragraphs <laughs> about their ion whole genome ion torrent deep sequencing on all these RNAs, right? And they see a lot of changes. So these are not plaque purified, right? These are going to be heterogeneous quasi species or whatever you want to call it, mutant clouds, blah blah blah. Swarms. So, swarms, another one. I like swarm a lot. You like swarm? Mm -hmm. I like quasi species because it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then you have nothing to say to the people who like reverse genetics. <laughs> I, I tried, Kathy. I tried, and I gave up because it's just losing. You know, you got to know when to stop fighting. That's right. important, right? So um, I'm mellowing in my old age, but they find pick, a lot of changes. Pick your pick your battles, right? Pick your battles. That's the way to put it. Yes, I learned that from raising kids. Actually, pick your battles. Uh, Thirty-five, what they call prominent. Uh, point mutation, which means it's over half of the sequencing reads. And, you know, only two of those were in the same two lineages. So every lineage in this experiment has different changes. Um, they're scattered around the different open reading frames. And interestingly, only nine of the changes were in the G and F open reading frames. That's kind of interesting, right? Because that's the one that's been codon deoptimized. There are changes elsewhere. Uh, you know, folks, this is all like distraction. It's not going to meet Yes, us. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm, They're almost I'm, like stringing you along. I'm but going that's through because, this. That's because going, they- oh, crap. I got to remember this. <laughs> and then I get to the next part and I go, no, I can forget all this. Basically, here's the bottom line. They got these prominent mutations and they said, well, let's find some that are not so prominent. Sub-prominent, they call them. And they find a lot of sub-prominent mutations. They actually study how these arise. They go back to their uh, individual passage times and they study how these changes arise. Um, and some of them appear, some of them disappear. Um, and then they, they say, well, you know, there's a cluster of six of mutations that are in this gene M2. And we know, uh, and M2 encodes two proteins and one of them, M2-1, is, is, is involved in uh, mRNA synthesis. It's an essential protein needed for, so these mRNAs, you know, the, the genome, the negative stranded genome has a number of open reading frames all lined up. And the way the mRNAs are made, you start at the first one, at the three prime end, you make it, and then the polymerase makes the next one and the next one. So it's a sequential series of mRNA syntheses. 
And so this M2 gene is important for sequential transcription. So they say, oh, maybe, maybe this is important for getting production of the right amount of, of uh, mRNAs. So they introduced these changes into both wild type and min B, and they look at growth, temperature sensitivity, syncytium formation, plaque phenotype. And you know, you could read all this, but in the end, the introductions did not create a virus with a phenotype similar to the past, the end passage, essentially. It had minimal effect. And then we're talking probably about many months of experimentation, oh, yeah. can you imagine? Oh, yeah. Going through all this, having lab meetings. Yeah, let's put that one in. <laughs> and in the end, no, it doesn't make much difference. Yeah, I'm, I'm more imagining the lab meeting with, no, it didn't work again. <laughs> it didn't work again. <laughs> so, and then I don't know where... It, they decided to do long read sequencing because they said maybe we're missing something, right? Uh, yeah, because I mean, all the sequencing you're doing is is uh, you're stuff. getting chunks of sequence out of a pool of viruses, so you don't know what any given full length virus looks like. That's okay? right. So if you want to know what individual viruses look like, you got to do long read sequencing. But right. uh, I, I I gather, although they don't state it, that getting a long read for the whole genome, 10 KB, is uh, close to impossible. Actually, they make cDNA clones and then and then sequence those. Yeah. But but so they do it in chunks. Yeah. They right? do it in I mean, big chunks. chunks. Yeah, two big chunks, right. Yeah, they do Amplicon A and Amplicon B, and they go, now, wait a minute. Some, some of these changes are only in one and not in the other. What's going on here? And that's when they said, oh, maybe there are deletions happening. I'm skipping over a lot of stuff, but I don't think you need to be dragged through it. But they basically found that um, presence of these M2 muta mutations that I've just told you about in one amplicon of one lineage, but not in another. They said, huh, maybe these uh, there are deletions. So they started <laughs> looking for that. And, you know, when you look where the light is, <laughs> That's where you find it. And they found mucho deletions, big honking deletions of thousands of bases. BHDs, um, big honking big deletions. honking deletions. <laughs> um, I mean, they call them LDs. Oh. Uh, LDs, well, they got large it wrong. Deletions, large deletions. <laughs> uh, and all of these uh, passaged viruses have extensive deletions. And you may be thinking, how do these replicate? Hang on, we're gonna we're gonna let you know. But the coolest thing is that what the deletions do is move the F coding region up in the hierarchy of of mRNA synthesis. So remember, we said that there's a left to right polarity uh, in in the way the mRNAs are made, and so the way the RNAs are ordered, we have the mRNA for NS1 is first then the N protein, then P, then M, then G, and then F, and then the polymerase is all the way at the end. And the farther right you are, the less protein gets made. The farther left you are, the more protein gets made. So the deletions are shuffling F up to the left so that more protein is made. Isn't that, well, that's the, the hypothesis, which they yeah. can then go on and test. I just think it's lovely. And mm -hmm. as you read this, you get the results little by little. There's a lot of details, you know, a huge amount of details, a lot of experimental data. And then you get to the punchline, which is these deletions, three of the four fused uh, NS1 and G. So there's a little short open reading frame, but it moves F up also. And the others moved F into the first gene position. So F is like, wants to be right there. And then you make the most of it. You're making more F. This paper is behind a paywall, okay? I had to, you know, uh, do my VPN thing and be a UF professor uh. for a few minutes in order to get the paper. But uh, for those who really want to look at it closely, figure two describes all the deletions relative to the parent genome uh, very nicely. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that moving the F coding region to the very first position or almost at the first position gives you more F. So they test that. They reconstruct these uh, viruses and they recover 
using DNA copies of the genomes and recover them and show that in fact, the, the deletion, the large deletions caused that you to have increased amounts of F protein uh, from that open reading frame. All right, so now you, you're thinking, oh, how does this work in terms of the virus? So uh, they say, do these um, deletions, do the viruses with these deletions, do they complement replication of the MinB? Right, the MinB is the virus, the codon deoptimized virus that they started with. And the idea is that these deletion mutants are complementing it. So they're separate entities, they're separate genomes. So just a reminder that MinB is attenuated. So it's not replicating as well as wild type, right? So yeah. that's what they want to see if these are going to do something and make it replicate better. Right. So yeah. the idea is that you have two genomes that don't really replicate well by themselves, but maybe when they are both in the same cell, they both you know have some of their proteins produced and those are enough to kind of work together. Um, and so it's sort of as if the, the two defective parts of the genome complement each other to work together. Complement is a geneticist's fancy way of saying help. Yep. <laughs> to help each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, here on TWIV, we complement each other, right? <laughs> we do. <laughs> so they make various combinations of, of viruses where they take a min B uh, and then they, uh, they mix it with viruses with various deletions and even those M2 mutations and they ask, uh, does it help MinB to reproduce? Does it help syncytium formation? Does it help um, uh, plaque formation and so forth? And so basically uh, the, the deletions really improve all the phenotypes of uh, the MinB and those mutations in the M2 gene help as well together with the deletions. And so the, 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 the shortest uh, large deletion genome, together with five mutations in in uh, in this M region, restored MinB substantially, not 100%, but uh, really did in terms of syncytium formation and plaque formation. Again, uh, same same outcome. I want to point out that this is a it's a reciprocal complementation. Okay, that's right. So MinB needs this uh, deleted particle, the deleted genome in order to grow because it supplies uh, extra F. Uh, right. But that deleted genome can't replicate by itself because it doesn't have any other replication protein. So yeah. it needs MinB in order to replicate. So they are mm -hmm. mutually interdependent. That's right. And so the the probably there was a small amount of the deletions present in the stocks to begin with. Because um, as I say, the polymerase is very good at skipping parts of the genome as it's uh, reproducing it. And so then those get preferentially amplified because they make a lot of F. And as Rich said, you, the other, the MinB needs F. So they're helping each other out. And, uh, these sort of uh, deleted uh, genomes that ride along with a, uh, a helper virus, uh, this is not new. Okay. Right. Uh, there, this, this sort of thing happens all the time in both DNA viruses and RNA viruses. Uh, known as defective, uh, quite often defective interfering particles. We've talked about them before because quite often the small genomes actually interfere with the replication of the uh, parent genome, but such is not the case in this particular case. In fact, Kathy used to work on DIs, right? Mm -hmm. In John um, Holland's lab, is that right? Yes. Um, I didn't <laughs> work so much on DIs as something that we kind of touched on earlier. I did parallel passages at high and low multiplicity of VSV and then mm. looked at the resulting genomes by a much less sophisticated method than sequencing. I looked by T1 fingerprinting mm. and it did not surprise me one iota here that all of these lineages uh, developed different sets of things because that's yeah. the results yeah, that I happened. got as well. So in your case, passing VSV, what you're doing is selecting for smaller genomes that reproduce faster, right? Um, and then they interfere with the full-length genome by taking things that the, the full-length genome needs to reproduce, right? That's why we mm -hmm. call them DI, defecting interference. But this is, these are arising by a similar mechanism, yet they're helping right. the MinB. 
So they say this is the first time anyone has found this, right? A defective particle that is actually helping, um, right? They do make that statement somewhere. Let's find it so that I don't misrepresent it. Um, there's such a mechanism of compensation was previously unknown for RNA viruses and suggests that the accumulation of deletion genomes has to be carefully investigated during production of vaccines. Boy, do you. <laughs> Yeah. So I got to tell you, I mean, we're, we're going here eventually, but I got to tell you what was happening in my head mm -hmm. while this was all going on. Because uh, when I think about this sort of complementation, what I'm thinking about all the time is multiplicity of infection. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because if you try and passage something like this at a low multiplicity of infection, where you do not have more than one virus particle per cell, then they it it you, these things won't be propagated because in mm -hmm. if you infect a cell with just the small particle or just the big particle they don't they won't do well they have to uh, be in the same cell together so i'm as i'm reading this paper i'm looking at oh how did they do the passage was it blind passage what multiplicities were they using <laughs> and i'm doing all these calculations and stuff and figuring well it's a little less than one or about one which means that they probably have a certain number of cells that are co-infected and then i'm thinking well this mechanism is never going to happen in uh in real life Okay, because it's mm. uh, very seldom that you're going to have a high multiplicity of infection in a natural infection, I would think. Um, and so, you know, this is probably just a culture thing. And then they say, oh, these viruses are capable of packaging yeah. more than one uh, genomic molecule in a virion. And mm -hmm. all of that thinking goes down the drain. Right. Because yep. if you can yep. put more yeah. than one copy in a virion, then with a single particle, you can infect a cell with both. Holy right. cow, mm -hmm. who knew? Uh, I, didn't I didn't know, know that. that. No, I up to nine, that. it's nine. saying. Yeah. I didn't nine. know that. No, it's published though. Yeah, uh, that's and amazing. they're pleomorphic, so they yeah. don't have to have a confined space and they yep. can take yep. up to nine. Good heavens. Yeah. That's amazing. Very cool. You got that, Dixon? <laughs> I you got do that? got that. Isn't yeah. that cool? I you got got good heavens. Yes, I did. You don't well, need a trichinella, co-infection. Trichinella <laughs> e equals one cell, muscle cell, get one larva, up to nine larvae in a single cell in a nurse cell this big. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, it's there are... Yeah. iterations Parallels. of nature all the way yeah. up through the uh, size zone <laughs> so hey, given what? that this kind of thing could happen uh yeah. in sure humans I mean, it could absolutely I mean, it does absolutely happen. absolutely yeah i think if it could it does <laughs> what, so another, another another point i wanted to make let's return to the g they say in the discussion we did not identify any large deletion rnas with the g open reading frame moved up right so G is the other one that they codon deoptimized in min B besides F, but they never saw G moving around. And they say this is likely because G is not needed for efficient replication in Vero cells. Hydroxychloroquine. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Same idea. You don't need G, which is really interesting because G is usually the it's the spike that attaches to receptor, but in some cells, F can attach and fuse. So you, you need G in other cells. It would be interesting to know if you did this experiment in uh, a relevant cell, a respiratory <laughs> cell, whether you'd get similar things happening. Probably, but I think you might want to do it, right? Um, and then you could see G moving up as well, both G and F moving, right. doing the shuffle. Right. Is this mammalian host restricted? Uh, or can you probably. infect like rat lung cells? Well, uh, you could do uh, human lung cells, right? You or you could do them. human lungs. But there's a, I think there's a continuous culture of rat lung cells somewhere. Oh, yeah. Bernie Weinstein, who worked in uh, But you can use human. You've got plenty of human lung cells. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, no, that's I'd, right. I'd like to see this done in some sort of animal fact, model. That would be very difficult. Fact, but uh, That reminds yeah. me. Oh, no, that's adenovirus. Cotton rat was the adenovirus model, right, Kathy? Correct. That somebody at NIH, Bob Chanick, used to use. Mm -hmm. did, they, did they use it for RS also? I don't know. I don't know. Um, there, There is a, a mouse virus 
that's related to RSV that has been used some mm -hmm. in animal systems because I remember. Yeah, they're used uh, for RSV also, cotton rats. Yeah, that's uh, right. This, well, the, the, no, but what I'm saying is that there's a different virus that's related to RSV. Got it. Yeah, yeah. That's a mouse it. virus. But but if you want to yeah. use human RSV, you can you can do cotton rat. Yep. Yeah. And who was do who used to do all that work? Greg. Somebody at uh, my age. Yeah. You, know who I'm Pro, thinking of? Prince, Price, Prince. Prince, Prince, yes. I think so, yeah. Yeah, it says here various animal species, cotton rats, mice, ferrets, guinea pigs, hamsters, marmosets, lambs, and non-human primates. So here's a thought experiment now. If you take Eckhard Wimmer's polio virus, where he code on de-optimized first, right? And I don't know if it's temperature sensitive, actually. That's a good question. I wonder if you could pass it enough and get these kinds of recombination events to, but you can't package more than one genome per particle of polio, right? Because it's an icosahedral particle, it might not work. Uh, does polio uh, generate defective genomes? Does, yeah, it does. So when uh, these alternate codons line up with uh, the tRNA, if if all the hydrogen bonds don't form, but 80% do, does that, serve as the basis for temperature sensitivity because it dissociates more easily. Could you oh. actually test that? You could test that, right? You have a triplet That's a RNA. Question. That's a good question. Why are these viruses and TS? Then, right. The protein is exactly the same. Look at the tRNA for just that particular amino acid and see whether or not it dissociates at lower or medium or higher temperatures. It's, you could do a very nice chemical experiment there. Is it TS simply because you're making less protein? That doesn't make sense to me. No, uh, no. That's not that's not obvious. And uh, likewise, a uh, uh, you know the other thing that comes to mind is it could be temperature sensitive because of the RNA structure stuff that we were talking about before. But if that yes. were the case, I yeah. wouldn't expect you to be able to complement it by just making more fusion protein. That's right. That's exactly right. So, so I don't else. I don't understand the mechanism. Of they didn't they didn't uh, mention that in the paper, did they? No. I don't think. No. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. One other thing that um, struck me is that first figure where they show their five lineages and what happened as they increased the temperature one degree every other passage is that one line goes way down at the mm -hmm. end. I yeah. wanted them to look at that and they mm -hmm. didn't, or at least they mm -hmm. didn't tell us about it. Well, they don't have much of it. <laughs> well, yeah, <that's> true. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, the other thing I was thinking throughout this is what are the implications of this for the use of this technology for vaccines? Okay. Yeah. Because as I've said, you know, this is a culture experiment and a, and, and a peculiar type of selection and would it happen uh, in a situation where you're using us as a vaccine? And a couple of thoughts come to mind. First of all, um, if you were manufacturing this vaccine, you would manufacture it under conditions where you under permissive conditions. So yes. that yes. the vaccine, the vaccine stocks that you use to distribute are all good stuff and don't have any defective uh, particles in them. Okay, so I would expect that you know in the individuals who are initially vaccinated, uh, there uh, shouldn't shouldn't be a problem. But then the question becomes: Would you generate defective particles in those individuals? Mm -hmm. And if so, if so, could those get around? be shed into the environment, get around to other uh, uh, other individuals. And I think that's a big unknown. The fact that you can package more than one genome suggests to me that, yeah, in an, in an animal, you might be able to, to generate these defective particles. Whether they would be shed and picked up, I don't know. But there are certainly, uh, uh, yeah. there's certainly yep. precedent in vaccinology for shedding uh, genetic variants of virus and having them uh, cause a problem. Right. Yep. Yeah. So would that still be true yep. if we thought about using this as a vaccine for something other than RSV that may not be able to package um, Maybe not. up to nine right. copies of the genome? Right. Maybe not. Yeah. So I was true. thinking about this. We, we were talking yeah. earlier about, uh, I mean, just I don't know why, but VSV comes to mind. I don't think, uh, Kathy, based on my understanding of the structure of that particle, it's not pleomorphic. I would not expect that that would package more than one genome, right? Yeah, I don't think so. So, good point. Yeah, I think I think coronavirus G, uh, particles are relatively homogeneous, right? Not as pleomorphic as I'm being led to think about RSV. So maybe 
and then you get 30,000 base genome, maybe only one is all you can fit in there. So I don't know. You have to do the experiment. The, the companies that are making these codon deoptimized SARS-CoV-2, they'll have to look at it, right? They'll have yeah. to pass it at high temperature and see if it reverts in some way. And not well, in vero cells. <laughs> and not in vero, please. No, no don't do that. I have a feeling that this is what they use in the lab, right? Sure. Because I, I said to Amy, I said, this should have been done in uh, some respiratory. She said, and she said to me, well, you used HeLa cells for 20 years, so right. don't talk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you get you use, I, you know, David Baltimore said, we use HeLa's because it makes a lot of poliovirus and we did biochemistry, right? So you use what you need to get your experiments to work. And that may not be biologically relevant in the end. Right, Dixon? Right. So any vaccine made against RSV would probably only use the G and the F. It's oh. just a, a, a small RNA segment, not the entire virus. Uh, that's a, I think that mRNA vaccines are being looked at for this virus for sure. Right. Yeah. Right. Then all of this you don't have to worry about. I agree. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So even you even hope that it's identical to the wild type. So this is the bottom line here. Genetic stability is a what is what is it? It's a pipe dream. It's pie in the sky. There's no such it's thing. Very... It's a concept that only humans invented. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I always, when I talk about vaccines in my class, I say, you know, we would like our attenuated vaccines to be genetically stable. Uh -huh. Very hard to do because of what the basic properties of viruses are. So maybe an mRNA vaccine is the way to go or a vector. It's cool. Anyway, this is relevant, right? I just want to say that when I was growing up as a scientist, <laughs> and was spending years at Rockefeller University, RSV stood for Rouse Karma Virus, okay? <laughs> still does. Yeah. You always have it to still does. Your so context. RSV and RSV, you know. Still does. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of the it's, early things I teach my class. Make sure which, you know which RSV we're talking about. Exactly right. Well, when I was a student, they, they, they told us, okay, RSV is Rouse Sarcoma and RS is, is respiratory sensation. Uh, but, you know, who's going to follow that? No. Who's going to follow no. that? All right. Uh, so that's a picture of uh, coronaviruses, the uh, 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 RSV. <laughs> or, oh, it is pleomorphic. Look at that. Yeah. Pleomorphic. That's right. Small and big. Pleomorphic. Uh, let's do a few email here. Uh, Rich, can you take that first one? Sure. <clears throat> Christian writes Is this Christian Drosten? <laughs> no. It's not. It is not. It is not, no. Okay. Somebody else. But uh, certainly with a knowledge of what's going on. It's a bright sunny day here in Germany. So the perfect time to send you a comment on your most recent TWIV episode 737. There are now more than 30 cases of immune-induced thrombocytopenia evaluated by German authorities. Uh, this is uh, relevant to the AstraZeneca vaccine that we talked about last time, this uh, apparent, uh, this adverse effect. To my knowledge, all of these are in lower age groups. So the risk in that subpopulation is both higher and clearly above background incidence for this particular type of thrombocytopenia. As the association is statistically significant and any causality that posit posits that AstraZeneca vaccination is the result of a propensity for thrombocytopenia or any confounding third variable seems implausible, it seems reasonable to characterize the incidence as vaccine-induced events. While the condition is treatable, it is not easily recognized due to its characteristics and its low rate of incidence in the vaccinated population. And lethality is clearly high once serious manifestations of the condition such as stroke appear. In Germany, the number of clinics, a number of clinics have decided not to recommend the AstraZeneca vaccine to their own employees after additional cases emerged in those and other clinics last week. Last Sunday, this precipitated the decision by German authorities who were themselves already looking at data collected about these incidents to no longer recommend the vaccine for people below the age of 60. If there were no other vaccines available for people below the age of 60, then the risk-benefit relation would still clearly favor the administration of the AstraZeneca vaccine. However, 
As the individual risk for COVID-19 for younger people is low, there are and there are alternative vaccines, and the buildup of population-based immunity can be achieved at the same speed by shifting AstraZeneca vaccine to the older population and the other vaccines to the younger po uh, population. The decision not to recommend AstraZeneca vaccine for people below 60 seems perfectly reasonable to me. Keep up the good work, Christian. Hmm. Nice analysis of the situation, it seems to me. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, show me the data. Uh, I, 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 to me, uh, this mm, is a problem definitely worth looking into, but in terms of cause and effect, uh, from my point of view, the jury is still out. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of, there's a lot, it, there's a lot, it smells, it walks like a duck. Okay. But let's wait and see. Ducks usually how it fly, flies. Rich. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or swim. Yeah, I agree. I swim think or drive. Is, uh, this is a nicely reasoned uh, point, but I agree that we need more data. Need but more it's data. A difficult position, right? Because very difficult. This is a lot of doses of this vaccine available. <clears throat> what I what I like uh, in this letter is his analysis of uh, the uh, COVID risk in different groups by population and the risk of complication in different groups by population, and then mm -hmm. so you could segregate out where you use what vaccine and uh, theoretically minimize the risk in each group. So in a sense, we're doing, I wouldn't say an experiment because obviously this is not an experiment, but you're finding out maybe who the subgroups of immune responders are. And these 11 people fell into that one group. So I'd love to know, go back and look at those kids and see what they had in common uh, for their maybe MHC or something else. It tells you what's going on here. Yeah, I'm sure that kind of stuff is ongoing. I'm certain. Maybe they all had trichinella, Dixon. Um, you know, there is a clotting disorder with trichinella, by the way. There is. There is. Well, that's I true, didn't know is. that. Well, now know you do. I was just trying to be funny. Can you I know, but your, that's not uh, funny. Trichinella is not a funny <laughs> topic. Can you move your um, boom away from your beard? Thank you. I'll try. I'll try. I actually trimmed my beard in anticipation of today's show. You, know, I, you, need, to, you, you need to shave it off on that side. <laughs> yeah, you I, I, I need stick. a better muffler. <laughs> uh, Kathy, can you take the next one? Sylvia writes, hello, TWIB team. You will probably get lots of comments on this, but just in case, I thought I'd drop you a note on the discussion about pulling back on the syringe prior to injection when delivering an IM intramuscular shot. I'm a paramedic and we are routinely taught to pull back on the syringe when giving an IM injection. The main reason being that a drug will be absorbed much more quickly IV intravenously than IM. So you want to make sure that you aren't in a vein if you intended to be in a muscle. A good example would be epinephrine administered IM for anaphylaxis. If this was inadvertently given IV, it would be more potent and could cause some significant side effects such as tachycardia and hypertension. Pre-hospital care providers, paramedics and firefighters in our area are now giving COVID vaccinations. We have all been taught to pull back prior to injecting the vaccine to ensure that we aren't in a blood vessel. I think it's just good practice that if something is supposed to be delivered IM, whether it's a drug or vaccine, you want to make sure you're actually giving it in the muscle. I will also comment that it has been quite a privilege to participate in the vaccination effort. In our area, we have mobile units that travel to senior living facilities and underserved communities, as well as mass vaccination sites that can do hundreds or potentially thousands of vaccinations a day. After seeing some of the devastation of COVID over the past year, it is great to be able to play a small part in bringing the pandemic to a close. And Sylvia is a paramedic, as she indicated. So thank you. I think uh, um, Daniel also commented on his clinical update about the same thing. So yeah. we now have it from two sources. And I am getting a barrage of emails from people who say it's wrong to pull back. So go figure. <laughs> Go wow. figure. I mean, they're quoting some handbook of immunization practices saying never pull back hmm. because, but, but obviously Daniel said you should, we always do. He said, yeah, we always do that. And Sylvia, and I'm sure, so I don't get this. I don't get it. Maybe they're afraid the needle will clog with some tissue or something. 
I, I had meant to ask Daniel, but um, hmm. I'll ask him on Thursday. But it seems to me that uh, I've, everybody I've asked around here said, yeah, it's standard practice. I just, I guess we don't notice it. Does anyone remember when you got your... Uh, I no, I look dress. away. No, I had, <laughs> I, I had tears of joy in my eyes. So I, and I wasn't, uh, no, I was looking at the camera. <laughs> my wife was photographing me the whole time. And I, I, I have a look on my face like this and then like, <laughs> that was the moment of truth. <laughs> All right. Thank you for that, uh, Sylvia. Uh, Brienne, can you take the next one? Sure. Uh, I don't know if we're, if it's Denis or Dennis. Denis. Denis. Uh, Denis writes, hello all. We've been watching TWIV for the past year in Abu Dhabi. We mm -hmm. recently returned to New York following my retirement. In Abu Dhabi, we received the two Sinopharm doses, the second one over six weeks ago. The question is whether we should sign up for one of the U.S. vaccines. I'm 68 and my wife is 74. We received negative PCR results last Saturday after being tested four days after arriving back in New York. Any suggestion would be greatly appreciated. Regards, Denis or Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> ah, didn't we review the Sinopharm? It's an inactivated vaccine, right? I'm just looking that up. To yeah, make it's sure. it's the the one from China. Yeah, but there are both inactivated and vector yeah. vaccines from China. Yeah, yeah. One's there's an Ad Five, right? Uh, if, it's if an you, inactivated vaccine. Yeah, I don't know. Then I think we reviewed that data didn't we didn't we do the paper uh i think, I think we, we may did. have and it seemed to me that it was a good immune response uh, right i don't i don't so recall far. reviewing any of these that were not uh, efficacious what i would suggest well first of all getting vaccinated again it's not going to hurt you no uh, as far as i know uh i would suggest one thing you could do is uh get tested to see if you have antibodies to spike mm -hmm. I, I would yeah, I was just I was just going to say, um, if if you're eligible to donate blood to the Red Cross, which uh, having been in uh, Abu Dhabi, maybe not, because uh, there's some mm. foreign living components, but you could find out. But anyway, American Red Cross is testing, and they will tell you your results, and and they know that people are donating blood in part to find out if they're antibody positive, and they're okay with that because there's such desperate need for blood. 68. Okay, so I'm 68. And so I would... Jesus, I, how did you get to be 68? <laughs> you weren't 68 12 years ago. TikTok. <laughs> no, I wasn't. That's right. That's right. Um, and I'm going to be catching up to you soon, Rich. Yeah, I know. Because I, I've stopped aging. <laughs> Nobody's going to catch me. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't... If I got two Sinopharm, I'm, I'd be okay with that. I actually like the inactivated vaccine. You get a few more proteins in addition to Spike, you know? Yeah. I like proteins, more, more right. T-cell epitopes. Mm -hmm. Hey, hey. So I think you're good. But, um, you know, I would just leave it to you because we can't give medical advice here. But yeah. uh, mm -hmm. uh, personally... If I got two, I, I th in the beginning, I, th I thought the inactivated vaccines would be great. Of course, the mRNA stunned us all, but uh, I'd be okay with Sinopharm. So you're good. Right. Uh, Dixon, can you take the next one? You bet. Gary writes, dear guardians of the Twivoverse, before I begin my rant against Pfizer's fact sheet for recipients and caregivers, and there's a website listed, please accept my thanks for the hours and hours of fact-filled fun you've provided to your huge following. I am a retired pediatrician and feel it a duty to spread the word of your existence. Kudos. Okay, to my rant. <clears throat> my sister-in-law was finally offered her turn to receive the Pfizer vaccine. As she waited for the injection, she was handed Pfizer's vaccine fact sheet which she only later read in detail. She came away with the impression that this was an entirely experimental vaccine, that she may end up with COVID disease despite the vaccine, and that there really wasn't much benefit in her having submitted her own into the, to the injection. My wife spoke to me about her disappointed sister's experience, which drove me to action, reassuring her of the safety records of the various vaccines and the enormous success they have had, rendering recipients 100% protected against severe disease, meaning hospitalization and or death, by, which by any definition is success. This kind of CYA handout 
undermines public confidence in vaccines and is obviously counterproductive. I hope you'll read this letter to your audience and that it will get the word out that at least one vaccine manufacturer has a few legal department CYA deadheads that are injuring the public and effectively adding ammunition to the naysayers. Who knows, maybe we can get a more realistic and encouraging rewrite. Again, many thanks for your good work, hmm. Gary. Hmm. Well, well, yeah, it's pretty black and white as to what an experimental vaccine is, and all right. of the ones so far are because they got emergency approval. However, um, have you ever had a medical procedure and they have to give you all of the possible things that can happen? Yes, they up do. Up to and including death. Yes, yep. they do. Yep. yep. It's so, like the, I think of the drug ads on TV. Mm -hmm. Oh, where they, yes. You know, where they have but all they speak the very things fast. that go wrong. <laughs> and it's interesting because everybody, everybody, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people get in a big flap uh, about the vaccines and the possible side effects and that kind of stuff. And then they see a commercial for some drug on TV. Yes, that's all this right. horrible stuff could happen. And exactly. They ask, ask their physician for it. Oh, I got to have this. I, I always say I'll take two. Whatever it is, I'll take two of those. <laughs> <laughs> you know, read the read the. Um, uh, I'm I'm probably the uh, fact sheet on uh, birth control pills. Mm. Uh, reads like a death sentence. I would imagine. How about on a pack of cigarettes? <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> but anyway, Gary, thanks for what you did. To, oh yes, yes. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. Tell her yeah, her. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is um, and for us to bring it up because other people are going to see the same thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, uh, he, he reminds me that I read the fact sheet on the Moderna vaccine and it's a similar kind of thing. It's this laundry list of all of the terrible stuff that could go, yeah. go on and, and that it's uh, got emergency use approval. It's not licensed, blah, blah, blah. Okay. It makes it sound like you're a guinea pig, but no. I never got a fact you. sheet and I got the Pfizer vaccine. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I didn't either, but you can get it online, but you know, this is de rigueur. So. Right. I mean. Yeah, uh, I, I agree. It's great that you countered it. That's what you need mm -hmm. to do. I mean, I, I kind of want to commend the person for actually reading the fact sheet. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yep. I, I, I wouldn't have the other day. I had a fact sheet for something, you know, comes out of the box. It's, it's a square inch and then it's uh, 10 square feet when you unfold the whole thing, <laughs> two accurate. sides. And I'm like, who writes this stuff? And, and my wife, Lawyers. You know, I, I knew people who used to write this as a living. <laughs> they write the package inserts. You know? Right. That's Oy. exactly right. What was that? Gosh, I don't know. All right. Anthony writes, where's Hoffa buried? All right. So this is a follow-up to something that got <laughs> mentioned a while ago. Mm -hmm. mm. Sad to relate the zero temperature mentioned is the Fahrenheit scale. I don't know what that refers to. But anyway, some years back, Anthony writes, I owned an international harvester utility vehicle, the missing link to the SUV <laughs> that I used for my bird seed delivery business. A thumping sound from the shaft let me know that the universal joint was soon to fail. At a local junkyard, I spotted a likely prospect for a transplant, but someone had already removed the wheels. With the vehicle flat on the ground, there was no way for me to get underneath to remove the shaft. I asked an employee at the junkyard to lift up the wreck with the yards high-low. No can do. The high-low got stuck in the dirt yesterday. I looked down at the ground of the junkyard. Generations of oil and broken glass had mixed with the earth to form a solid asphalt-like surface. Plus, the temperature had been freezing for weeks, actually around zero some nights. I stamped my foot. Oh, that's where the temperature comes in. Got mm -hmm. it. Wait a minute. Can I just interject? Is this yeah, car yeah. talk? Sounds like it. No, you? this is uh, this is Anthony. <laughs> just going to ask that know, question. I it really was. It just, it just sounds like car it's, talk. Keep going. Yes, no, this is. We'll um, Have you thought is, of rolling the car over by hand? <laughs> <laughs> so this is an excerpt from a blog post that Anthony wrote on December thirtieth, two thousand and nine. Okay. Okay. This is from his blog. It's not car talk. <laughs> All right, Jose. Um. This ground's hard as a rock. How'd the wheels of the high-low ever sink in? What the hell is a high-low? What, what is that? It sounds like a forklift or something mm -hmm. like that. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Here, follow me and see for yourself. I went with Jose along a maze-like path through the stacks of junk cars. Soon we found the high-low teetering over to one side. I can't figure it. Day after day, I go by here. No problem. Now look what happened this morning. A neat six-foot by two-foot section of ground had given way and dropped down maybe a foot 
two wheels of the Hilo were hanging over this little precipice, unable to gain traction. Jose continued to explain, I wait for boss. When he gets back, he can tell me what he wants to do now. Jose, don't show this to anybody else. Hoffa might be down there. <laughs> That's Anthony. Okay. I thought that was a cute story. Yeah. Um, and Anthony writes nicely. I said, uh, I yeah. told him you should write books. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So that's, um, ooh, the next one is really long. Uh, why, don't, why don't we do just that one more? Uh, and Rich, you could read it. That's Juan. Okay. Juan writes, dear Twift team, please allow me to um, uh, shed some light on some issue about Colombian vaccination that came up on episode 734 by a distressed fellow Colombian citizen living in the Netherlands concerned about his or her grandma. I want to start by stating that certainly Colombia is not an exemption for corruption and a country with many uh, critical ethical issues at various levels. Several scientists slash physicians slash healthcare workers, myself included, are very harsh critics of some of the most public policies in healthcare and other areas in this country. However, it is fair to say that our society has been guided by a government that has asked for hard and uh, asked for and heard the advice of health experts and has made efforts to unite the whole population around the idea of providing COVID-19 vaccination as an inalienable right for all citizens and legal or illegal residents. In that sense, the presidency and the Ministry of Health have issued, passed, and implemented an emergency law for COVID-19 vaccination. As of today, a national vaccination plan for COVID has delivered uh, 1,182,000 doses, of which 54,500 are second doses in a campaign that started on February 17th. Vaccination phase one encompasses 100% of health workers and allied personnel and all citizens age 80 plus. Um, all those people make up 1.7 million of roughly 50 million nation. So for a four week period of uh, time, this is surely slow, but this is the best we can afford in concordance uh, to our resources. We do not have unlimited and prompt access to vaccines that are obtained at much higher comparable costs than those uh, uh, for other countries in terms of health budget related per capita, re related to per capita GDP. Our vaccination resources that were considered as an example for Latin American region have been put to the toughest test and despite all uh, previsible uh, efforts, we will not reach a vaccination pace comparable to first world countries. Of course, errors have been made in the process and corruption cases have been detected. Those unfortunate cases are not the majority. Those do not make the real problem with regards to COVID vaccination in this nation. I regret their occurrence as much as I regret the ill press this country has gotten, sometimes well-deserved and many more times unjustly. The vast majority of Colombian people are lawful, caring citizens, as is the case with most nations in the world. As a physician working in a tertiary care facility, I can say that those errors were scrutinized and actions had been taken. I am concerned about the uh, aged lady from episode 734. She should have been vaccinated by now, or at least she should have been scheduled for her first dose in the following days. Either Pfizer, BioNTech, or Sinovac vaccines are available for phase one vaccination. Both contemplate a second dose. Please feel free to use my contact info to provide it uh, to your listener in the Netherlands as someone who will guide and assist his or her granny in the process of getting her vaccine. I thank you again. I again thank you, Dr. Racaniello and your crew for all the good work you do for so many people in distant and not so famous places like Colombia. Basic sciences educating people is remarkable. You guys have helped me polish my rusty and outdated cardiac surgeon virology concepts since last year when our service shut down for a few months due to lack of ICU beds. Fortunately, I found you guys. This has prepared me to volunteer along with many other health workers at academic hospitals in educating and training an army of vaccinators to speed up this process. 
with best regards, Juan, uh, who's obviously an MD, uh, cardiac surgeon in uh, Colombia. Hmm. So this is in response to a letter we had in 734 from someone in the Netherlands whose grandma was living in Colombia and uh, had not been vaccinated. And it was uh, uh, alleged in the letter that the problem uh, uh, with her getting a vaccine was corruption in the system in Colombia when, when it came to vaccine distribution. I forget the details, but you can look up the letter at, at any rate. I find this uh, a really nice letter, okay? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, right. uh, that says, you know, yeah, uh, there are problems <laughs> as there are everywhere, but um, we get uh, probably an exaggerated bad rap. And I really like his sentiment that as with everywhere, there are good people everywhere. Probably the majority of people are just trying to get by, you know, and they're good, caring individuals. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, the, the uh, few that are not kind of spoil it for everyone else, yeah. don't they? Right. Yeah, it's very nice. So I appreciate and, that. And, you know, I, I my father was a cardiac surgeon. He didn't know any virology, so <laughs> I'm impressed that you knew some. That's good. All right, time to do some picks. Dixon, what have you got for us? Of the ant, as you have never seen it before. This is an article that occurred in the New York Times, and they are touting ants as the great neglected uh, life form, I guess. <laughs> you know, that's not true, though, because E.O. Wilson has really done an amazing amount of uh, publicity for this group of insects. But I've never seen ants this way before. I've either seen them with scanning electron micrographs or a slightly out of focus, um, you know, magnify- magnifications. These, it looks as though this ant could walk right off the page and sit down and start telling you what it's like to live in a colony. <laughs> I, I just absolutely love ants anyway, but ants will astound you in every way possible because they they are aware okay they have a brain but they're also programmed with chemicals which prevent them from expressing their full breadth and depth of intellect this is the better way to put that because ants i mean just i don't know i just can't say enough good things about ants so i thought i would just show you this article that just recently came out that shows wonderful close-up pictures of various parts of various kinds of ants. Beautiful. So there. And if Alan Dover here, I would say, Alan, this one's for you, but you know, it's, I'll make it for everybody. Cause I think ants are incredibly important. Uh, they do pollination uh, work in the tropics. They uh, discard, they eat all the waste that we throw away. Right. <clears throat> Otherwise the world would be filled with piles of uneaten goodies. And I, I just love ants. I just, even fire your, ants. I, I your, like your, your rap about uh, ant intellect uh, yes. brings to mind uh, one of Richard Feynman's books. I think it's uh, Surely You're Joking, Mr. Oh, Feynman, yeah, 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 where he talks about his curiosity, uh, the, the, the sort of evolution of his curiosity. And as a youth, um, uh, playing with a trail of ants and ferrying them to different places to try oh, yeah. and figure out how they knew where they were going. I forget the details. Sorry, I have, a, I have a neat thing to do in case you're in the summer and with nothing else to do but just look at the ground. If you have a little um, vial filled with about 2% or 5% formic acid, you take an eyedropper and you fill it with that and then you spell your name out on the sidewalk. <laughs> and the next thing you know, you've got the Ohio State marching band spelling out, you know, <laughs> Kathleen T. Spindler. <laughs> or you could put something more rude on right. the ground and see, look at those dirty little ants. <laughs> KRS, Dixon, KRS. KRS, TMI. Okay, fine. Um, Dixon, uh, we had an ant biologist on Twivo last year. Daniel oh, yeah. Cronauer, he's at The Rock. Oh, nice. And he he works on army ants, which he calls the wickedest insects ever to roam the planet. I would say that's true. Well, I think mosquitoes are more sinister, but in a different way. That's he has true. a, um, well, he said these uh, army ants will strip a carcass bear yeah, in, the, in the forest. And absolutely. he has a nice book. So he takes photographs of his subjects, right? Not yeah, only yeah. does he work on them in the lab, but he goes into the field 
and he sent me his latest book, Army Ants, which is just beautiful, oh, amazing photo. I mean, the nests are incredible, They're huge incredible. webs, and they change every night. Exactly. They go exactly. somewhere else. They get exactly. tired of their location. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Ants are pretty cool. I, I have to admit. Right. When's the My last time you saw an ant? When's the last um, time you saw an ant person? When it was coupled with an uncle, actually. I was visiting some okay. relatives. And <laughs> Dixon and I do uh, stand up together. Brianne, what do you have for us? Um, so I have an article that I find myself referencing um, in conversation with people really often. I actually referenced it uh, with someone in a conversation yesterday. Um, and so I thought I would... Uh, give it a little bit of information. So this is from Nature. Um, it's called Small School Science. And it is an article talking about what happens in the labs at a small liberal arts college um, where we have undergraduates um, running our labs like I have at Drew. Um, and I read this article right after I kind of started on the path of working at a small liberal arts college. Um, and I still find it to be the best description of what my life is like and kind of what it is like to work at a small liberal arts college um, of anything I've ever read. Um, and so I think that this describes kind of the pros and the cons and sort of what it's actually really like here. Um, and so whenever people ask me things, I give them my description, but then I also say this article for me is sort of exactly uh, what it's really like. Um, there's one line in here that talks about how um, working at a research institution versus working at a uh, liberal arts college is like uh, competing in the winter Olympics versus competing in the summer Olympics. Um, they both just take different sets of skills. Um, and some people are better for one than the other, but they're both, uh, you know, sort of challenging, prestigious, cool things to do. Neat. Excellent. Very, cool. Very nice. That'd be a great resource because people, especially people in graduate school and that kind of stuff mm -hmm. have, have these questions. Yeah, no, yeah. exactly. And it, I really, you know, everything that they say in this article really resonates with me. Um, I like how there's the discussion of what undergrads can do and how much fun it is to hang out with them and their enthusiasm, um, which I, I, I often will have, will be me, you know, having a rough day and then we'll come across my students being delighted by something in the lab and sort of remember how delightful uh, that is in the lab. I still remember the first time I taught someone how to uh, look in an inverted microscope at some cell culture cells. Um, we were using some cells that are suspension cells and the, the student was very worried about whether they were focusing the microscope correctly. Ah. Um, and so I, I was showing them and I said, well, you know, with suspension cells, you have a little trick. You can just kind of tap the side of the flask and they should shake with the liquid if you're actually <laughs> looking at the cells. Um, and I came back about 10 minutes later and the student was still sitting there at the microscope. And, bing, 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 and just <laughs> back and forth and watching the cells slosh around and thinking how cool it was. And, you know, those types of things remind me how cool um, science is all the time because my students was my students get excited. Excellent. Cool. Very nice. what, what, have you, what did you think of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, by the way? Because that's all about a small liberal <laughs> arts school. And it's got a soft underbelly that's, you know, don't go there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I'm thinking more specifically about, you know, what the life in the lab is like compared oh, to yeah, labs sure, that sure. people may have spent more time in. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Rich, what do you have? I have a Washington Post article that was sent to me by my buddy Nassine Masachi. Hmm. entitled Smallpox Virus Squads and the Mandatory Vaccinations Upheld by the Supreme Court. And this is a nice little easy read piece on sort of the history of requiring vaccination. As we've talked about many times before, vaccine hesitancy goes back as far as does uh, vaccination. And this describes um, basically the run up to a Supreme Court case that uh, dealt with uh, whether or not uh, it was uh, constitutional to require uh, vaccination. Um, and uh, basically, uh, the Supreme Court decision is actually very interesting and uh, applies to much more than vaccination. But let me just read the hmm. uh, essential sentence here. The liberty secured by the Constitution of the United States to every person within its jurisdiction does not import an absolute right in each person to be at all times and in all circumstances wholly free from restraint. 
There are manifold restraints to which every person is necessarily subject for the common good. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. This is uh, 1905, and it applies all over the place. Now, uh, so, you know, people can be required to have a vaccination to go to school, et cetera. Um, uh, what you can't do is hold somebody down and vaccinate them by force. You can penalize them if they decide, if they decide not to be vaccinated, okay? And I suppose you can exclude them from certain activities, all right? Uh, but you can legally compel them or require them to be vaccinated. This also has a nice little video about um, vaccine passports and whether or not they're a good idea. Uh, with history involved in that as well, uh, talking about the yellow card, the cer uh, certificate of international certificate of vaccination that I used to carry around, showing that I had been vaccinated against smallpox as a child, etc. Yep, yeah. yeah. I remember traveling to Europe in the '60s. We had a brain yep. proof yep. of vaccination. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. However, I think this would be overturned by the current court. Uh, wouldn't that be interesting? Because who, if if anyone ever institutes, which I don't think is going to happen, but someone would challenge it for sure. And the court would most, but you never know. Sometimes you can't predict what the court does, right? Mm -hmm. That's the greatest thing about the court is you can't necessarily predict what they're going to do. Yeah. Yeah. That's very interesting. This picture, uh, compulsory vaccination in Jersey city. I saw that. So cool. <laughs> <laughs> very cool. I like that. Maybe, Kathy, what, maybe that's why public health was invented, because most of public health takes place behind the scenes, water purification, food inspection, that sort of thing. So people don't know it's there, and therefore they can't object to it. But if they knew it was there, believe me, I remember a group objecting to the putting fluoride in your drinking water to prevent yep. tooth decay. It was a communist plot, God damn it! I know it was. I can swear it was. You know, and... Um, the only communist plot I was aware of was the graveyard in behind the Kremlin. Oh, well, that was, you that know, was another bad um, joke, actually. I got it. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> I know. You go uh, <laughs> go to the Times today. You can read about how a very large uh, religious group is not going to be vaccinated for against COVID. Mm -hmm. So um, we're constantly confronting these issues. Kathy, what do you have for us? I picked something called the Transcontinental Burrito Tunnel. <laughs> and um, it was published on April 1st, but it actually has some good science in it. And uh, it's kind of corny if you saw film strips or movies in the 1960s. Uh, it's kind of like that, but it's made more recently. And, um, uh, and it's got uh, Newton and Bernoulli and it explains uh, several different things. And the, the idea is if you drill a tunnel into the earth, then gravity would accelerate something toward the center and then it would then be able to continue going on out to the other side. And so if you could do that, you could deliver burritos, for instance, from San Francisco to New York. And it was a weird <laughs> premise to me that you would want burritos <laughs> from San Francisco. I mean, to me, you would want them from Southern California, but Sourdough whatever. Bread, perhaps. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> but um, anyway, it's it's pretty fun. And then and then the science concepts in it, I think, make it worthwhile. So and then it, mm -hmm. one of the commenters wrote, um, it reminds me of the science movies I used to watch in elementary school. It's just missing the film flapping off the reel as it ends. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Cool. Well, I, I want to have a burrito now. Dixon, you want yeah, to I get do a too. burrito? <laughs> sure. Let's go out and get a burrito. <laughs> um, my pick is um, this uh, musician, I guess you could call him, Robert Tiso, who plays on glasses. My son showed me this a couple of months ago. You know, you if you run your finger oh, on a yeah, glass. Sure, those are but great. this guy has whole arrays in front of him in the glasses great. have different amounts of water to get different notes and he plays good pick, good pick. amazing things. I mean, it's just incredible what this guy it's does. Good, good it stuff. doesn't, he doesn't miss a beat. <laughs> it's perfect, right? Boy, nice. he must have practiced a lot. And in his YouTube channel, which I linked to, he's got all kinds of pieces, you know, Tchaikovsky, Bach, Bach, uh, uh, and I guess as Valero. the tune uh, progresses, 
uh, that changes because the water is evaporating. <laughs> well, it, it depends how long, but uh, he's very skilled and he uses all different kinds of nice glasses, you know, and different sizes and so forth. So yeah, yeah, I just good. think this is just stunning. Glass I agree, music. I agree. I agree. <laughs> all right. So that's a little, that's uh it's a science pick. This is the science mm -hmm. of making sound with a glass with you different bet. amounts of water okay. in it. I mean, I used to get excited when I could take one glass and make a mood in a yeah. restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> and my parents would be, stop that. You're disturbing <laughs> other people. But this guy has hundreds. All right. That is Twiv740. Microbe.tv slash Twiv for the show notes. Send us your questions and comments. Twiv at Microbe.tv. If you have something for Daniel, that's Daniel at Microbe.tv. If you like what we do, consider supporting us. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Dixon Pommiers at trichinella.org, thelivingriver.com. Thank you, Dixon. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's a very nice pleasure. I love spring. That's all I can say. I just love spring. <laughs> I don't know what that has to do with TWIV, but... Uh, well, today, I mean, come on. <laughs> Are you going fishing, uh, you're going fishing tomorrow? Tomorrow, I am. I'm very nice. Uh, have fun. In Pennsylvania, is that right? Thank you. Yep. Yep, yep. Right. I'm going to try not to fall in. <laughs> Brianne Barker's at Drew University, Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thank you, Brianne. Thank you. It was great to be here. Rich Condit, Emeritus Professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure thing. Always a good time. Kathy Spindler's at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Good I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIV is viral.